the twist. What's up, humans? This is Katie Rose, straight up with a twist. Welcome to the show. So this weekend, I had the opportunity to take my mother to New York City for her birthday. It was Per her request. And, uh, you know, she is starting to get into retirement zone and is like, let me do the things that I can do before I'm, you know, retiring or maybe even getting to do a few things after retirement. Funny Girl is on Broadway with Leah Michelle and she loves Barbara Streisand. And so she said, this is what I want to do. And so we made it happen. And it's such a cool thing. Um, when I remember my childhood growing up, you know, we didn't we didn't have a lot. We were always paycheck to paycheck and we had a lot of losses. Um, so it's not like I had like one childhood home. I did have one that I stayed at um, for a very long time, but um, we lost that. And, you know, it was always just moving around, you know, locally. Um, and so I don't know if anyone out there knows this, but I was born in San Francisco and then moved to Florida when I was seven. So there'd just be these little things. I just remember, you know, saving up. Uh, once I was able to work, I worked and and I would just save up my money and then I'd do little surprise things like I'd fly my mom to see her mother, my grandmother in Ohio um, and surprise her. And I took her to Vegas for the first time and we saw Celine Dion because you must, though this was not the Barbara Streisand that um, I know would be amazing if, if she would do Broadway. But Leah Michelle, man, it's really cool to watch a person like live out their dream like this is like her dream role you know this is what she's always wanted to do and all of these audiences you can feel the joy that she has you know and the audience feels the joy and we're just everybody I mean almost every song was a standing ovation like people you know even at times I'm like don't clap too early I want to hear her sing the whole note you know and of course I'm excited and the audience is excited and I cried I cried three times and it's really not just it's not because somebody executed a sad scene it's because it's good theater you know and you know, there's just a couple times my husband, my husband's also a performer and, you know, le leans over and looks at me and he knew exactly why I'm getting emotional because it's just, it's such an incredible thing, especially after, you know, the pandemic for two years. It's just, it really, it can be very emotional. And I think people should get out there more and, and see musical theater because it, it really does something to you. And it really, it really does make you forget about the hustle and bustle of life. It, it, you know, takes you away. And, and I really think it's important for mental health. I think, I think all forms of entertainment are, are, are so, so much more valuable than, than we think, you know, people don't view it as a necessity. And I, I feel like it is, you know, um, I, I really do feel that our, emotions uh, need to be tapped into more. And I think that it's it's an amazing therapy that people overlook sometimes. You know, I, I feel like a lot of times people are getting, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of bills because they're going to see a therapist and, and it doesn't it doesn't always help them maybe the way that they need to. I feel like our prescriptions shouldn't just be drugs. It should be listen to some music, do some yoga. I mean, maybe some doctors out there are doing that. I'm not sure. I've been to New York I don't know, over 20, 30 times. Um, I, when I toured with the circus, I was at Madison Square playing there for three weeks. Um, and I've always gone back for equity auditions, uh, callbacks, things like that to visit friends. Um, you know, and, and so I know, I know this, that city, you know, more than most places. The two places I've been to the most are, are Las Vegas and New York City. Um, so those are more familiar to me. But I, I gotta say, I, I feel like New Yorkers, everybody feels different about this, but a part of me feels like when, especially when you're a performer, it's like, I don't know. I, I remember when I was in my twenties going to these equity auditions and I feel like people would say that they loved it, but I almost feel like they're wearing this like badge of honor, but they don't really love living there. It's just like they say it because they want to be a part of this community. And really, I mean, the only reason a performer is in New York is to try to be on Broadway, even off Broadway, um, and, or any of the big theaters out there. And that's, that's your, like, that's your drive. That's like your main purpose because it is so ridi ridiculously expensive. And speaking of mental health, I, 
realized something very quickly about myself. And I, I literally had to like psychoanalyze myself. I'm like, why am I getting angry right now? <laughs> I'm like, I am an angry human being right now. And I was angry because if the subway was delayed or if it smelled bad, if I had to hold my breath, I had to continuously be like putting hand sanitizer on because we're on the subways and we're doing this and it's a little further distance than I thought and there's all this construction. Then I'm tripping because of, you know, well, I'm avoiding puddles of piss and then I'm, you know, tripping because of the construction or, you know, just different, you know, the dips in the roads, you know, uh, cars not paying attention. I'm like, oh, we're going to get hit by a car today, you know, because they don't care and everybody's honking, you know. You know, and it is just like I I have I'm also like an empath, right? So I can feel other people around me in a way. So I feel like it, it's almost like this like terrible superpower to have, you know. <laughs> I, I can feel other people's energy and they're frustrated and they're str- and so then I'm taking on that stress and I just like got short with my family at times and I was just like I'm sorry (laughs) like I'm sorry that I was acting like that I'm like it's just every you you know and plus I'm kind of I'm always the planner there's always I feel like there's always somebody in the family who's kind of like the leader and I just got stressed from being the leader you know what are we doing now what do like the in-between person everyone's asking I felt like I had children like asking me questions every five seconds you know and then on top of that just like the stress of the city itself you know and then it's like once you're in the theater I'm like ah I'm like, oh, what's that out there? <laughs> what's going on? You know, it really is quite the escape. But I, I don't, I don't know. I would never want to live in New York City. There's no way I could do that. I mean, and I feel like it's cheaper just to fly up and audition for things. And nowadays, with everything being online, you know, I feel like you know, being online is is the new thing. I, I, I really hope. I was talking to a friend about this and. You know, I, I know that she misses performing in person and I feel that so hard because it's so different. I, I really do feel like feeling somebody's essence and their total personality in person, even just like a quick introduction. You know, you ever heard that story of Kristen Chenoweth? It was like when she walked into an audition, she like, I think she had like a, a shtick if I read this correctly, unless it happened on accident, but it worked for her. But she like walked in and like dropped all of her papers on the ground, like her book, her music book, and then made a big thing about it and was like, being a lots of personality and like funny about it and then she performed but it was because of the way she handled it and interacted with everybody and it was funny that they were like oh she's a funny girl and it wasn't just like let me sing a pretty song for you and I feel like you know there's so many rules with filming you know how do you film exactly when you're at home plus not to mention if you're in the city filming ooh man it's like good luck because where we were in Mad- by Madison Square Garden was a nightmare like it I'm like wondering why anyone's honking their horns even. I'm like, what do you honk? You know, they're not, they're going to go. I mean, there's nothing, your honking isn't going to change anything. It, you know, I think it's just a, this extension. And I feel like they feel like it's like a, oh, yep, hey, I'm right behind you. But I think everybody knows you're right behind them. So I feel like the honking is just mean. I'm like, there are people sleeping. There are people trying to sleep. And you, I mean, literally one of the nights that we were there, I swear the guy had his hand on the horn for an entire like two whole minutes and like the horn almost broke it was just like (laughs) changing like you know failing to make the the horn sound correctly like the pitch was changing uh he was holding it for so long and I was like my goodness and just constant ambulance noises like typically I guess I have found other places when I stay there in the city and the like cacophony of sound is is usually a little bit more blended and this was not blended it was just annoying and it was so hard to sleep and my husband brought this <laughs> you know you can like download an app um but he wanted to have something where he didn't have to like use the power of his phone um like I guess to waste battery I don't know I'm like if it's plugged in at night who cares but um he brought he has this like little tiny device and it has like you know 12 different sounds to choose from so we were like playing like raining sounds like storm sounds like nostalgia from Florida weather like I don't know um but it did help it actually did help to drown drown out some of the noise noises. Um, but I, I do, I miss that in-person quality, you know, auditioning. And I, I really hope that we, we get that back. It does help you remember people more so. 
as well. Um, and you know, some and granted, the positive about auditioning at home is if you mess up, you can just do it again. But sometimes. Uh, even the microphones can distort the way that your sound is and then like the way that you're singing it in the room doesn't quite come out how it does on the phone so then you're having to play with things anyways but yeah I I couldn't I just couldn't I couldn't live in the city I I felt I felt like you know three days was plenty of time to be in New York and I was just getting I was getting stressed out you know homelessness is is rough and it's it's hard to witness that kind of struggle a lot of it can be dangerous too it's just It was tough. And the smells, oh my goodness. My mom was like, maybe they could pump out. And I'm like, this isn't Walt Disney World, mom. Like, she's like, they could pump out smells. And I was like, at this point, we need like a tsunami of bleach to just come through the city, (laughs) just clean it all Um, because there's so many dirty things. And then, of course, we had terrible service at our hotel. We showed up. And first of all, I didn't, I don't ever book through a third party. I think I'm just... I, you start trusting these companies because they're big companies. And then when you actually start digging into it and finding reviews in different areas, not just like their main website, you start realizing these third parties, like just always book through the main person because they're the, they're going to be the only ones that can actually help you. I booked through Priceline. Never again. Never doing it again. Um, I also booked Expedia for my flight. Never again. So apparently these third party companies, it's like you you get this good deal. But then like if you want to buy baggage, they charge extra because it's third party. So like on Spirit Airlines, I'm like, oh, yeah, I knew it was going to be like thirty five dollars for a bag. And then I went to buy my bag and they're like, oh, well, since you booked through third party, it's actually fifty one dollars for a carry on. I'm like, are you serious? I'm like, they're like, yeah, if you would have booked through Spirit, it would have only been $35. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So just all these things that you learn, plus like Spirit, oh my gosh, we like witnessed this uh, one girl get in a fight with the, you know, Spirit airline worker uh, that's at the gate. And she was so mad that they would not let her bring her bag on. You know, I, I years ago remembered that they have the little cubby and you have to fit your bag in there. And my bag fit except for the wheels. And they wouldn't let me bring my bag on. I was like, it's the wheels. I'm like, I don't even understand. I'm like, don't you like do this based off of like standard size suitcases? Like I'm so confused right now. Like it felt so scammy that like, obviously like industries build these tiny bags at a certain size but you know spirits like but not the wheels so then it's got to be got to be this extra tiny bag so then like I remember after that happened I started like trying to invent I like to invent things and then never do it I tried I'm gonna tell you I did I tried to get a patent for an invention once and I tried to pitch it and apparently there had been people even before me that tried to pitch these things and they're like keep going keep trying like eventually sometimes someone will bite and man it's just like like I couldn't get anyone to bite on this thing and then getting a prototype. Oh my God. It's like, how do you do these things? Like, you know, it's, it's very, very tough. It's very tough. Um, trying to figure those things out. Anyways, I'm sitting there. It's kind of when Jimmy Fallon, he had that ring emulsion where like he slipped and fell and then his like finger got caught on the table cause he was wearing his wedding and then his like finger like ripped off oh my god that major surgery he had and he said that he was in the hospital like trying to find inventions for like new ways to wear wedding bands like you know like when you have a cat collar and it like falls off the cat's neck if they get like hooked on something as an emergency escape they should do that for wedding bands but then it's like well then what's the quality of the gold if it can just like snap apart in case of stuff and the people's rings would probably be falling off anyway so I guess he was like trying to make one so I was thinking the same thing I was like well you know I'm like maybe we can invent a bag where you like push the bag down and then the wheels pop inside of the bag like a turtle shell, you know, but then the wheels would have to take up space on the inside of the bag. But that's not the point. The point is, you know, it's the shape of the bag that was the issue, not necessarily what could fit in it. Like the wheels could probably fit in it if I could take the wheels off and put them inside the bag, you know, but it was just because of the size. So I just hate those scammy companies anyways. So we, I booked this hotel and I was so proud of myself because I was like, I'm just going to spend a little extra money. I'm like, I'm going to spend the money so that we can have a great time. It's my mom's birthday. Mm. And, you know, I was looking at the hotel and all of the website information looked really great. The pictures looked beautiful. It looked really clean. And they were like talking like it's artistic and luxury and I'm like cool and so I booked the Stewart Hotel right by Manhattan by Madison Square I'm sorry Manhattan by Madison Square Garden and did I say Manhattan earlier I, I meant Madison Square Garden so I book it and 
you know, getting closer to the date, I'm just checking my reservation and I'm like, I see it says it describes the room as studio sleeps for people. I'm like, studio? I'm like, I booked a one bedroom with two double beds and a pullout couch. And the whole reason I did that was so my mom would have her own bed, my brother could take the pullout couch, and then me and my husband would get the second bed. And then it had like a kitchen and I was like, in case we, you know, have water and whatever. You know, I'm looking at it and I... I'm like, wait, I think this says studio. And then I look up the description on the Stewart Hotel and it, and it was a different room. And so I call and I go, hi, I booked through Priceline. I booked and I remember it was 610 square feet. I remember the size of it because I was like, I wanted it to, to be big. And I was like, and this room is supposed to have a pullout couch. And she's like, well, Priceline booked the studio with two double beds. I'm like, there's no pullout couch. And she's like, no. I'm like, well, how are we going to remedy this? She's like, well, we can't do anything. You have to call Priceline. So I call Priceline and I'm on the phone with them for hours, hours. And the, the, he's like, well, I'm going to make a note of this. He's like, oh, I'm trying to call the hotel. And I was on the phone with him for so long while he was on the other line trying to call the hotel and couldn't get through. I'm like, okay. And so then, well, let me try. So I try calling the hotel and I get in and I get on in two minutes and the hotel and I was like oh can I just ask you about this and it was like the reservations number and she was like oh she's like yeah but unfortunately we don't have any rooms left so even if you wanted the room that you booked we have nothing we're fully booked for the weekend I'm like well great I'm like well maybe we'll have to deal with it I'm like well could we have a cot or something you know and she's like I don't know she's like I don't do that part you'll have to talk to the front desk and I'm like okay so I call back Priceline again and they try calling again. So there's like my second phone call and there's they say they can't get through again. I'm like, well, I just got off the phone with them. They're like, well, we need to talk to the front desk. So then they claim that they call the front desk. They still couldn't get through. So we couldn't ask about this information. So he's like, I'm moving this to priority. You'll hear something within the next few hours. I'm like, great. Didn't hear anything for the rest of the day. Second day, I call back again and I talked to this really nice lady and she's like, I am pushing this, you know, to priority and you're going to be number one on the list. And I spent another hour on the phone with her. She's like, hmm, the hotel's not picking up. I'm like, weird, because I called them the other day and they did pick up. She's like, well, what did they say? So I told her what they said. They didn't have any rooms left. I'm like, so then what's your purpose? I'm like, how about you just give me partial refund since I'm not going to be getting the room? And she's like, well, we got to talk to the hotel first. And I'm thinking, what kind of protocol is this? Like, it's your fault. I told you I talked to the hotel. They said they can't do anything and they have no rooms. And then she's like, well, do they have cots? I was like, I don't know. And regardless if they did, like, are you paying for this? Like, usually they charge you extra. And of course, when I did show up and asked on the day of, because once again, she's like, I'm pushing you to priority. Didn't hear anything back at all. I show up to the hotel and I asked, do you have cots? And she was like, it's $50 a night. I'm like, well, I'm not paying for that. I didn't even get the room I paid for. Um, and she, I asked her if she could do anything. And she's like, no. Coincidentally, I'm in line and I hear another woman on the phone with, with Priceline doing the exact same thing. And she's like, hey, I'm on the phone with them. They say they're trying to call you. They say they're trying to call you. And the lady at the front desk is like, nobody's trying to call me. I'm standing right here. And I'm like, Oh, that's interesting. So then after we stay there and my, you know, my brother, you know, eventually slept, you know, in the bed with my mom and it's fine. Like whatever, it's her son. But like he like slept on the floor like the for the first few hours and we're like, just get in the bed. And it's like, it's fine. And he's like, All right. you know, I just felt bad that it didn't work out. You know, this has happened to me before. And it's it's just sad that like people don't care to like remedy these situations. You know, they make it like you did something wrong. I'm like, I did nothing wrong. I'm like, I paid good money for this. Like, I don't even understand. And nobody wants to remedy the situation. But the thing is, when we showed up in the room, room is way dirtier than the pictures look. This thing is just, you know, it's like put some a piece of wallpaper up and some track lighting and they thought that that was going to make it look nice. We didn't even have pillowcases, like the basics. We didn't have blankets. We didn't have pillowcases. We had two towels for four people, which it said there was four people. They knew we had four guests, no hand towels, no shampoo, conditioner, lotion, nothing. And I'm like, and then they had these like refill bottles that were empty. Uh, I'm like, this is, we don't even have the basics. We didn't have extra toilet paper, ran out of toilet paper, toilet paper, had to call for that. I'm like, what? Like dish soap, like 
they didn't even have a bottle opener, like not a wine bottle opener, which would be extra. We did have that. We didn't have like a beer bottle opener, you know, just like little things, no wine glasses, nothing like what kind of kitchen was this? At first, we didn't even know where the fridge was. We were like, is there, there better be a fridge in here. Um, and no light in the closet. So like we couldn't see our clothes and there wasn't even that m- many hangers or drawers to put our stuff in anyways. It just, it was bad, you know, old furniture, scratches all over it, like, you know, it was just really bad. And I was, and the beds were not comfortable. We only got two pillows and they were really flat pillows. Um, and it was just very frustrating. You know, when you, when you pay good money and you think you're getting this luxury thing, which like, I don't mind paying for if I'm getting what I'm paying for, you know? So, and, um, so then when we are finally done with our trip, uh, I, I get to the airport and we went to the old airport cause it was spirit. And it was like, the old, like the original OG, they even had like showing like, you know, it's like a circle and like the doors were vintage and it was basically the vintage where they started flying and then 1929, you know, and so they're showing and I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. And it was kind of great, actually, even though it was like the crappy cheap part of the airport because we flew in with Delta and that side of the airport was brand new and gorgeous and state of the art and So, but when we got here, it was actually kind of great because there was nobody there. So we like got through TSA in two seconds and then like, it was just like, like nice little quaint airport with a bathroom and a bar. And I was like, eh, it's not so bad. Um, The flight itself is like Spirit Airline. It's like a brand new plane, but like still super, everything's super cheap. I don't know what was with our, I think it was new flight attendants and they like did not know their spiels. They didn't know what to say. It was like hilarious listening to them. Um, But we landed a half hour early. Not sure why. I guess he flew faster or something. And then we had to just like drive around And then they're like, sorry, guys, we don't have anywhere to go because we're early. So then finally they get us in, but they park us at the wrong side of the airport. So then we all go to the wrong baggage claim and then we have to walk all the way to the other other baggage claim. And then we still waited for like another 45 minutes to an hour for one bag, you know, and I'm like, this is just (laughs) not, not good, you know, and and I know people were saying like traveling is terrible right now, but I got to say like, I'm definitely just going to stick to a couple of airlines now. Like it's just not worth the stress. Like, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, so I would recommend don't book through third party. Um, oh, what I was going to say is when I was in the airport waiting to get on the flight, cause we got there early and TSA was two seconds. Um, I, decided to try a different form of communication because I didn't want to just like be on the phone in the airport with Priceline again. And I was like, I'll just do it since we have time. I'll do the chat. So they give you a text option, which is stupid because the text just takes you to the chat. So I'm like, what's the point? Um, And then there's no way to email. Like there's no way to email anybody, Um, like to write a letter to the company or whatever. Um, And then later I did end up looking up executive names and emailing somebody. We'll see if they get it. And those executives are Brett Keller and Matthew Tynan or Tynan, T-Y-N-A-N, Chief Financial Officer, and Brett Keller is the Chief Executive Officer and, you know, CEO of the company. So forget them. And, you know, they make $1.9 billion a year. And I'm like, okay, well, then you can afford to give me a partial refund because I didn't get what I booked. You know what I'm saying? And, and so it's just really tough. So then I started chat. I went through three different people. I screenshotted the conversations and all three different agents that I spoke to and it was miserable. I just had to keep starting the conversation over again. And then they said that they they did, they did the same thing where they're like, oh, we're calling the hotel. And then like by the third person, I was like, I'm beginning to think that you're not actually doing that. I'm like, because this happened on three of my last phone calls. And now at these three different agents, you're all saying that you're calling the hotel. And, And I witnessed that other guest. And I'm like, you're not calling the hotel. This is a scam. I'm like, you're just blaming it on the hotel. And then I explained the story again. And I said, just so you know, I've already spoken to the hotel. They don't plan on refunding. They told me to speak to you. And they're like, well, our protocol is that we have to call the hotel. I'm like, well, that's not working for you. And you're clearly lying to me because I can call the hotel and I talked to a person and it was just fine. So it's it's a scam. And it's, it's very um, saddening. And I started reading other reviews of people who went through the exact same thing. And I'm like, I... I don't know. And I did debris that there was a class act on something else, um, something about the taxes and like they would claim they don't claim the taxes or I don't know. Um, it, just weird things like that. And I'm wondering if there's another class act for things like this, because I, I saw another comment and somebody said it was a bait and switch. I'm like, that's exactly what happened to me. It was a bait and switch. So just be careful out there. You know, it's 
you know, one of those things you, you continue, you say if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And I felt like the my price wasn't too good to be true. It's like what you would have paid. Like, But, you know, traveling can be super stressful. The thing is, like, I continue to do it because once I'm there, I have a great time. But, yeah, the travel part is always a nightmare. And I, I just wish that there was transparency. Transparency, as they say. And your cocktail of the day is the Witch's Brew. One and a half ounces of Midori melon liqueur, one and a half ounces of Cointreau or triple sec, one ounce of fresh lime juice, and an egg white shaking in a shaker and served in a low ball glass with ice. Add a Luxardo cherry and enjoy. So that part kind of sucked. Uh, but we also saw Hades Town. Um, Hades Town was good. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see the leads that are normally in it so we had the swings and they did a fine job they did great um but I I don't know I wasn't as invested I think there was an intensity that was kind of missing from the show I also didn't realize they were just going to stick to like the one story um you know there's many different avenues and stories of all of the Greek gods and things and so I didn't really realize we were going to just stick to this one tale so I was kind of waiting for more to happen and then I'm like oh we're just going to talk about this um but just incredible like the stage that theater too is gorgeous the Walter Kerr theater and I was just like oh I if I ever you know own a mansion I was like I want my ceilings to look like this like it just you know the gold brushing and like the wood carvings and a lot of those you know historic theaters it's it's pretty amazing when you think about how long they've been there and how many different performances there have been and that they just maintain that beautiful um aesthetic uh and architecture and just stunning uh uh, we also went and saw The View. It is definitely more of a democratic view. Uh, and I, I thought, gosh, if there are Republicans in the audience, this would be difficult. But it's kind of like known that there probably aren't any. Um, plus, uh, Chelsea Clinton was there uh, as well. And uh, Sherry Shepard was there, which I was excited to see her. And I, I thought all the ladies looked stunning. I just kept looking at their clothes and their hair and just seeing, like, the interactions between. It kind of flew by, you know, uh, the actual show itself. Um, and I thought Joy actually looked beautiful. Um, but people always look skinnier in person. And I'm like, wow. Um, and the only thing that was making me laugh, though, too, it's kind of the same thing as the pictures situation on the hotel. They looked great. Um, on TV, the view looks like really clean and sharp and, and then in person, like they like roll out this rickety, you know, uh, light up table that looks like an Ikea thing and these like really thin, cheap chairs. And I'm like, oh my God, it looks actually like solid furniture and it looks really like fancy, like modern on television, you know, and then you just start, you start seeing all the, you know, it, uh, imperfections and everything and you're like oh it's not as fancy you know as I thought um, but I always think it's cool to see those behind the scenes experiences but I also wanted to point out that there was a a show I was I was reading a bunch of different shows um, in the playbill and like upcoming ones and I saw that one of the shows I want to say it's some like it hot that's it's not out on Broadway yet but it's I think it's starting next week and I believe that's the one. I'll have to look it up again. But where it said directed and choreographed by the same person. And that brought me so much joy. And I just, I feel a lot of times, especially since I've choreographed some, you know, high school musicals uh, and I, I do choreography on the side. And, um, you know, I teach dance, I choreograph. And I feel, especially with doing musicals, a lot of times like the choreographer doesn't, get as much credit kind of like in the film industry like stunt choreographers and stunt people don't get as much credit when like that's the whole reason you like Kill Bill and that's the whole reason you like a lot of those action movies is because they make it look awesome and but the director always seems to get all the credit you know they're the ones winning all the big awards and and even if people do win uh, other awards it's like those are the ones that don't get like the press and that you don't remember you know you don't remember their names and it just made me happy to see that there are people taking on both roles now because a choreographer can direct, especially if they have any kind of acting chops or like theater experience, um, which is kind of like where I'm coming from now. I'm like, I could totally fully direct a show at this point. Um, and half the time you are still, you know, 
directing kids in a way. You're blocking them and they're kind of like, well, what am I doing here? And you kind of have to explain it to them. Um, and of course, it's, you know, also about staying in your lane, um, which I, I feel uh, in this industry, um, I have experienced people that do not stay in their lane. And I, I, I've, I've noticed that sometimes people will be so concerned about your lane and how you're doing in yours that they crash in their own and don't even realize that they're not doing what they need to be doing. Um, and, and I've seen this happen, you know, with other, uh, you know, directors if, if they're not focusing. And I really do believe you, you need to find the right match. You have to find, you know, a person that you work well with um, to make that magic happen. Uh, you know, I've heard it on film sets too that people love – collaborating and, and, and working with other people and, you know, everybody just gets it and it's like, okay, to talk about things and no one's trying to make it just about their vision and the only thing that they see, you know, you have to trust other people's instincts and intuitions as well and, and listen to other people. And then that's usually when the magic happens, you know, it's when people are too worried about what you're doing and not what they're doing when like the reason that these people are hired is probably because they know what they're doing, right? And you have to trust somebody's work. But I love what I do. I just, sometimes I I feel like people don't realize how much a choreographer does, especially in a musical. It's like, it's number after number, you know? It's, it's the majority of the show where we're doing movement in it and telling that story, you know, to the best of our abilities. Um, and, you know, and if you have a great director, then you, you talk about, you know, the overall vision. And if they want to tweak anything, thing you you discuss those things too but you know usually there is a, a a certain amount of trust and I you know for my experience you know usually directors love that especially if I do have experience in other areas um because I they know I can handle it you know what I mean and then it gives them a break because they got all but a bunch of other things they're working on too especially if you're a teacher as well you've got eight million things that you're working on not just directing and and usually you know that choreographer is there to take work off your off of your plate not not to give you more um, and I, I, I just want to kind of give a shout out to choreographers and, and I just have so much respect for what they do. And I really do feel like they bring a, a large portion of the magic to what you see um, in the theater. Uh, so just want to give a shout out for that. And also just to reiterate with that, it's there's really no point in a vision if you can't execute it. You know, there are some people that talk the talk, uh, but they don't walk the walk and they say they have this big vision of something, but if you don't know how to verbalize that, if you don't know how to transpose it, you know, whatever area that you're in, then it's just in your head. You know, it's, you've, you have to be able to execute it. That's what, that's what makes you good at your job. You know, worked with directors before where it's almost like they have this dream, but then they don't know how to explain it to you. You know, like we all have weird dreams that it's like, ah, oh, it's really hard to explain. You know, it's kind of like that. But the good thing about theater is most of it's written. So you've got the framework. So you should be able to execute, you know, your vision and just with a few tweaks here and there. But I also take issue with, you know, people that, you know, first of all, they're credit takers, right? Um, or I don't know what's going on. Maybe some people don't have the experience, like the actual experience, like themselves being an actor or doing these things before they become directors. Like, I, you know, I think that like on the ground experience is, is very helpful because I think sometimes people go to school and then they have an idea of how maybe a director should act, um, because of movies or thing or other people that they've seen sh briefly and they think that's how it's supposed to be or something. Um, but we have to get away from this, this attitude, which we've been, I mean, we've get, been getting away from this like casting couch and, you know, I, I struggled, especially in my older age and with trying to have kids. Um, look, I can be stern with my, my kids and I, I do a lot of reverse psychology, like, Oh, you don't want to participate. Okay. You don't have to. All right, well, I guess you won't show your mom what you're going to look like later, you know, like <laughs> just like little things. Uh, and it usually works pretty well. I, I've got a few little tricks up my sleeve that that work with kids. Um, but what I can't tolerate is teachers making fun of kids. And it makes me think that they were made fun of and now they feel like they can do it or they're immature, they're young, they don't have the experience. They, they think that this is still what people do. Um, and you know, it's like those who can't do teach type of a thing. And I'm like, wait, we're here. Cause we're trying to like, you know, work on 
the minds of these kids for their future. You know, the children are our future. And we're making fun of them. Like I've been in a few situations where I'm feeling very uncomfortable because, you know, I'll be at like the audition table and then it's like, you know, whisper, 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 let's make fun of this kid. And I'm like, I don't know how to react to this right now. You know, I usually just like, will look away or I don't comment because I'm not going to say anything back. You know, I just let them talk to me. And then I make note and say, I don't want to work with this person anymore. You know? Um, and, and I think it's, it comes from insecurity, I guess, uh, is probably where it really comes from. But like, we're, we're, I just feel like we're too old for that. Like, yeah, okay, well, these are kids. We're not on Broadway, you know? And sometimes I feel like I have to remind people of that. Like, we're here to have fun, and these are the kids that we have, and we're going to use them to the best of their abilities, and we're going to try to make them look good. Um, I had a I had a teacher recently, and it was very, very offensive, but um, I but I handled it. I'm, I'm getting better at doing that. Maybe old Katie would be like, I'm going to say something, you know, uh, and get really angry and storm off. But uh, new Katie is becoming more patient, and that's probably the thanks to my husband and just being older. Um, but you know, I was told, you know, I, I like to be clean if, if, especially if I'm working with kids that don't have a big dance background. Um, so, you know, you play to people's strengths and it would be better to look clean in my opinion and sharp than, and it's my work that I'm putting out there. Right. And I was told to give them super hard moves. It doesn't matter if they can't do it. I'll send them to a dance studio over the weekend. And I was like, what? (laughs) Is that what you think it takes to be a good dancer? You just go to the studio for one weekend and voila, you're a, you're an amazing dancer. It's, it was just like, it, it just felt a little cringy for me and it was duly noted, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, as many times I, I didn't feel respected. And here's the thing. I really like this, this person, like on a like casual talking basis, like I'm like, Oh, the, you know, I could kick it with this person, but like, I don't know why they act like this in this kind of a setting. And, you know, you know, I've been in a few experiences where I've noticed that a lot of people, let their anxieties and their frustrations come out weirdly towards the kids. Um, And there's also this like, hmm, how do you call it? Um, Organized chaos. So like they're super chaotic. And if something is going wrong, they have to push the blame to somebody else because it couldn't possibly be them that is unorganized or making everything confusing and stressful because they have a, a vision and they know what's going on, you know, and I think that's the problem is, is the execution, right? They think that they're organized, but what's actually coming out is not, you know? Um, and, and I think it really takes a, a special kind of a, a, a person to do these kinds of jobs, especially with children. Uh, and I certainly love doing it. Um, but when you work with people, um, that are chaotic like that and don't respect your position, it kind of takes the fun out of it, you know? And what's interesting is is kids can tell. Kids can tell, you know? I had a kid at the end of show once and um, not too long ago that came up to me and said, I just wanted to tell you, thank you so much for being so respectful towards us. And I'm like, wow, that's a very specific comment. Like, of course, of course. Like, and they're like, you were such a, a great mentor and I really look up to you and you're just like, wow, you know, that's what it's about, you know, and kids notice kids know what's going on. And, you know, I usually, man, I, you can see my facial expressions and I'll do stuff. I'm getting better at just being like, if I am not in charge, I'm only here to do my job. And if everything else falls apart, I'm not taking that with me. Like that's has not, I do this one thing, you know, like I said, the stay in your lane thing kind of a thing. But, um, but you know, I, I love what I do. I, I really, I love choreographing. I love working with kids and I get really emotional now. It's really hard for me because I, I feel like they're my kids for, you know, just the few weeks that I'm with them and then I'm proud as well in a different way. But it's also very emotional for me because I'm like, that might not happen for me. I might not get to be proud of my own children, you know. Um, But I did miss my cat. Oh, my gosh. My cat missed me so much. He was like howling, crying. He missed me so much. And and I just snuggled with him. And then I was 
just sitting on the couch and he doesn't do this very often, but he like walked on my lap and curled up and then sat in my lap. Usually he'll just kind of lean on me and he's like, mommy, I miss you. Like, and cats don't like really make that much noise. They do meow. They talk to humans more than they talk to one another. Cats don't really talk to each other unless they're hissing and running from you, but they talk to humans a lot, you know, um, with their little meows and, but they blink a lot and my cat will roll on his back and be submissive because he's like, hug me, rub me, pet me, you know, um, rather than like how a cat, a dog will like jump up on you, but it's just good to be home. And I think that's kind of, what vacations are about as well. It's like you go out and, you know, vacations can be fun and stressful at the same time. But when you come home, you like appreciate your home so much more. You're like, ah, you know, vacation from vacation, you know, and you really look around and you're like, I love my home. I love my things. I love my cat. I love my life, you know? Um, and that's just exactly how I felt when I got home. And I'm appreciative that in on this journey, we were able to afford to go on this trip because most of my life, this would have just been a dream to, you know, be able to do those things. And, you know, I am a person and I think everybody spends their money differently. You know, some people spend their money on Starbucks every day. Some people spend their money on makeup or, you know, uh, whatever they, their teeth, I don't know, whatever, whatever they do, their hair, right. You know, cosmetic things. Um, you know, I spend my money on experiences. I, I like experiences. Um, I like to take pictures a lot, uh, digital photos, uh, to remember the memories. Cause I gotta admit, I even came across some videos the other day and I was like, Oh my God, I completely forgot about that. So like, thank God we can do those things. Cause I'm telling you, there's no more space up here. It's like with this digital world, my brain is just all over the place. Like I can't keep up with that anymore. And I kind of got upset that I didn't remember this thing. I was like, how come I didn't remember that? (laughs) My brain is just deteriorating. I'm like, gosh, I wish I could use the full capacity of my brain um, in the way that I'd want to. But um, anyways, I'm having a warlocks, a witches and warlocks party this weekend. Um, I don't do Halloween. I've never been a big Halloween fan. Um, I'm going to see if I can convince my husband to pass out candy tomorrow at the house and to also maybe dress up like the Hulk and I could be She-Hulk. But we'll see. Look, he got in, he does like... He makes like miniatures and he does 3D printing and he bought an airbrush machine. I'm like, well, then airbrush me green. Hello. Um, (laughs) Or I'll just trick you all and I'll do the She-Hulk filter with my little outfit that I got. Um, And then I was like, it'll be cute. We could pass out candy to kids, of course, kids. And I'll just cry at how cute they are and that I don't have them. Um, (laughs) It's going to be a great Halloween. I'll probably be drunk by five o'clock. I'm like, hey, kids. Then I'm just a true alcoholic at that point. Hey. Just sad old lady with cats. Look at this. Don't go to that crazy lady's house. Uh, The year before, we got like exactly three children. And we were so excited too. Um, And we like put, um, we have like a, we have a projector. So we projected on my white garage and we were playing Hocus Pocus and night before Christmas and we were hoping like kids would come by and see it and stuff. And like, we didn't even get any people. I'm like, maybe we put all this work into this and like no kids even showed up, you know? Um, but we'll see, we'll see if I can dress up like the Hulk tomorrow. But otherwise I just decided, you know, I'm not really, I don't like to do, it's weird. I like themed parties, like, you know, flapper stuff and whatever, but I'm not really big into Halloween. And this year I was just like, I'm into it this year. And I was like, witches and warlocks. And I've been watching that um, Sabrina series based off the comics with that girl, Abigail, who's in Mad Men. And it's actually a really good series. I was surprised. I thought it was going to be kind of like, I don't know, like Disney Channel style. And it's not. It's like really dark and mystical. And I'm like, this is actually a good show. Um, So if you haven't seen that, maybe add it to your list. Uh, Anyways, well, I talked. I was concerned I would have nothing to talk about, but (laughs) that's why I started a podcast. Here I am. That's all I know how to do. And you're going to get used to the way I talk. I go like on tangents, but I always will like circle back to what I was talking about because my brain is like Robin Williams and it goes like 5,000 miles a minute. Anyways, thanks for listening. I'll I'll catch you guys next week and we'll see what's up. Um, I've got some uh, more uh, nitty gritty topics to talk about. Um, So I will catch you next week. Always dropping on Mondays. Thanks so much for listening. This has been Katie Rose, Straight Up With a Twist.